Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> it sure is good to see you. And this is probably a good place for me to say thank you to those of you who come Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Uh, you have no idea how encouraging your faithfulness is to me. Now, we're currently in a sermon series that revolves around the life of David. Now, when we last uh, left David, he was a man on the run. You say, why was that, Ronnie? Well, the reigning king of Israel, Saul, had determined to kill David. You see, God was in the process of removing Saul from the throne and replacing him with David. God had made a decision. I want David to be the next king of Israel. And Saul knew that. Saul knew it, and he was committed to everything in his power to prevent David from becoming the next king, even if he had to kill him. Put yourself in David's place for just a moment. Suppose President Trump issued an executive order that you should be killed on sight. What would you do? If the President of the United States, with all of his resources, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, National Guard, Coast Guard, FBI, CIA, all state and local authorities, etc., what would you do if you found out the President wanted you dead? You say, Ronnie, I think I'd run and hide. I would uh, go off the grid for a while, try living underground, uh, fly under the radar. Well, where would you go to do that? You know where David went? David went to a town called Nob. You, may, you mean something like a Tomasi Knob? <laughs> no, in this case, it was just Knob. Plain old Knob. Now, who in their right mind would want to relocate to a town called Knob? Well, apparently preachers. The town consisted primarily of preachers and their families. It was a whole community of them, do you kind of see what I mean when I ask who in their right mind want to relocate to a town called Knob? Can you imagine that? If every neighbor you had was a preacher, listen, you couldn't go to Walmart without somebody stopping you and giving an invitation or wanting you to take up an offering. You're surrounded by preachers. Of all the places David could have gone, he went to Knob and he went there looking for help. When he got to Knob, he looked up the uh, preacher who was in charge. I guess you could say the senior pastor. His name was Elimelech. And Elimelech must have been busy in the tabernacle, this uh, portable place of worship that the Jews had. And he turns and there stands the infamous David by himself. Well, Elimelech, the preacher, is startled. I believe he <gasps> gasped. Donnie. And he said, what are you doing here? And what are you doing here all by yourself? And David said, well, King Saul has sent me on a top secret mission. Don't ask me for any details because it is classified. And, and as far as my men go, well, we've made arrangements for a time and a place for a rendezvous, I'll soon be joining them. And I want you to stop for a minute. I want you to think about something. Now, this part about meeting later on with his men, having a place and a time, maybe that was the truth. But uh, in regard to this top secret mission, David just told a lie. He told a lie. There was no top secret mission. Saul had not sent him on any kind of a task. And, and I point that out because I want you to notice something about David. David was indeed a human being. 
You know, we've read that God said of David, he's a man after my own heart. You go, Ronnie, how could a man after God's own heart do something like that? Well, remember how God said it, he's a man, emphasis on man, after my own heart. And what that means is he loved God more than anybody and more than anything. And his greatest desire was to please God, but because he was a human being, sometimes his intentions and his actions did not correlate. But David just did wrong. And then he says to Elimelech, uh, I'm going to need food. Do you have any bread or anything else? He, he was not, you know, choosy here. Do you have any bread? As a matter of fact, I think he requested five loaves of bread. Do you understand that David left in such a hurry? After Jonathan told him, your life is in danger, he left in such a hurry. He didn't have time to go by the house and pack some groceries. He didn't have time to go down to the Ingalls and buy a few things. He didn't have time to go down to the outdoor store and put together some camping supplies. I'm telling you, this was a man who left with nothing but the clothes on his back. He said, I'm going to need some food. And Elimelech gave him some bread. It was stale bread, but nevertheless, it was bread. And then David said, oh yeah, by the way, this mission is so urgent. I didn't even have time to go by the house and get my weaponry. Do you have any weapons on hand? Preacher, do you have a spear that you could loan me? Do you have a sword? And Elimelech said, we've got one sword we keep here. It's Goliath's sword. It's the one you used to decapitate him. There's nothing else. And David said, well, there's nothing like it. And if you don't mind, I'm going to take it. And so Elimelech gives him the supplies. Elimelech gives him the sword. And apparently Elimelech even took the time to pray with David, and when David looked up, there was a fellow standing there whose name was Doeg. Doeg had a rotten attitude, and I guess if my parents had hung me with that name, I'd have had a pretty bad attitude as well. <laughs> Doeg was the chief herdsman or shepherd. He was over the flocks and the herds that belonged to King Saul, and we're going to see this in a story next week. He was a guy who desperately wanted to be in better standing with Saul he was willing to do anything as long as it would curry him favor with Saul. And he was a guy that would stoop to anything. There was nothing he wouldn't do. He was a bad dude. And the moment David saw him, he suspected he's going to go and tell Saul that he saw me here. And so you know what David did? David left Nob. Again, he's a man on the run. He couldn't stay at Nob with, with the preachers and their families. He took off. And where did he go next? He went to a city called Gath. And I think this is an interesting city, an interesting choice on David's part. Where was Gath? Gath was in Philistia. Matter of fact, it was the capital city of Philistia. You know what that means, don't you? It means that David walked into a city and surrounded himself with Philistines. Now, who were these Philistines? They were arch enemies of all the Israelites. But if they had a hit list, I tell you, the guy who was on top of the hit list, the guy they wanted to take out worse than anybody would have been David. I tell you why. Well, David killed Goliath, who was a Philistine, and this was Goliath's hometown. This is where Goliath's family lived. And David said, I'm going to run there. Huh? <laughs> You know, you start thinking about this, going, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And, and, you know, they've written songs about David. David has killed tens of thousands of Philistines. And, and you go to the capital city. I'm telling you, this was the hub of Philistine activity. I bet this was the hub of Philistine military activity. And David goes there to hide. Now, you say, man, he's losing touch reality. You know what I think? I think he's a genius. If you're Saul and your men and you're trying to figure out David's next movement so that you could set a trap for him, I'll tell you the last place on earth you would think to find David is right in the middle, in the heart of associating, living with his enemies. The people who hated him more than anybody. I think it was a stroke of genius. The king of Gath was a guy named Achish. Now I don't understand exactly the relationship David developed with Achish. There's a real possibility Achish didn't know who he was. Maybe he did and he just did not care, but I don't think he really knew who he was. And I think he's developed some kind of relationship with David. But one of the things, there came a day when some of his military officers saw David and guess what? They knew him. You know why? I believe that they had seen him on the battlefield. 
Oh, they recognized him. And so they call a meeting, and Achish is there, and David is there, and they go in and they say, uh, do you not know who this is? Huh? This is David. The guy you're now associating with is David. The one who killed our champion, Goliath, this is him. This is him. The one who's killed tens of thousands of our comrades, that's who you're consorting with. The one who's going to be the next king of Israel, that's him. Now, David's sitting there hearing this conversation. What do you think he's thinking? He's thinking, I'm a dead man. I'm a dead man. Now, this is a tough spot to be in. And uh, where do I go from here? David is a pretty smart dude. He, he, he thought, thought on his feet. He had an idea. Uh, I'm going to fake insanity. So <laughs> all these guys are looking at him. And he just begins to foam at the mouth. He's just producing... Unusual amounts of saliva. I, I tend to do that around biscuits and gravy, but I'll tell you, he's, he's producing all these massive amounts, and he's letting it run down and run down his beard and drip to the floor. He gets up and he walks over to the, he starts scratching on the walls, he starts scratching on the doors, and, 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 and every, it must have been convincing. Because Achish said, I think I've got enough insanity in my world already. I don't need any more insanity. Do you feel his pain? I can kind of relate to that. And they must have interpreted, well, you know, probably at one time or another he was a threat, but since he's lost his mind, he's no more a threat. And so they backed off. And guess what David was able to do? He was able to escape Gath. And once again, he's a man on the run. Now, where does he go next? I want you to read. We're going to read 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2. And let's see what happened next. So David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Let's stop. So David's on the run again. He goes to this place called Adullam. There's limestone cliffs there. They're, they're, they're filled with caves. And David finds himself a cave. And before we think about anything else, I want to make sure that you're seeing exactly where David is at this moment. <laughs> He'll get that figured out. I trust him. We're pausing here in the cave because I want to make sure that you see where David is. David had hit rock bottom. I want you to think about all David had lost. At this point, David has lost his job, his position with King Saul, and it was a good one. He was captain of Saul's bodyguard. He was a leading commander in his armies. That's gone, Ferber. Gone. He has lost his best friend in the world, Jonathan. I think they meet and have a brief conversation once more in his life. Gone. He's lost his wife, Michael. Their marriage is over. And she's not coming back. Gone. He's lost his house. We've already looked at one story where Saul had soldiers uh, watch David's house. House gone. Now he's living in a cave. He's lost his spiritual mentor. He's out of touch with Samuel. I think he's lost his self-respect. You know, what he did in Gath was a real spectacle. He's lost his security. There's not really a safe place on the earth for him, not for long. And I think David is in that cave, and he's assuming that he's lost his future. There's probably no way I ever get on that throne. I don't think I can succeed with Saul on my heels like this. At this point, David had lost everything but his life. 
and he is alone. All alone. As painful as loss can be, there's something that can intensify the pain of loss, and that is loneliness. Do you see where David is? He's at a low point. His pursuit of God's plan for his life had brought him to a low place, perhaps the lowest place of his life. I think it would be safe to say that David had hit rock bottom. Now, before we continue reading with 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2, I want us to read Psalm 142. And you say, why would that be? Because David wrote this psalm. And in most translations of the Bible, this psalm has a heading that reads, a psalm of David regarding his experience in the cave, a prayer. It should be in your Bible. What does it mean, Ron? It means this. This psalm was a, actually a prayer that David prayed in the cave of Adullam. And so when he finds himself in the cave, what does he do? He prays when he hit rock bottom. He prayed, and let's read his prayer together. You ready? David said, I want you to get a mental image when you think about his state of mind. He's in a dark, damp, and depressing cave all alone. He gets on his knees, and this is what he said. I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. When I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I look for someone to come and help me. But no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. Have we ever been there? David said, when I get there, and I'm there now, then I pray to you. Oh Lord, I say, you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. Hear my cry. You see this next line? For I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they're too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. What happened after David prayed this little prayer? Let's go back to 1 Samuel 22. Let's read verses 1 and 2. 1 Samuel 22, 1 and 2. So David left Gath. And escaped to the cave of Adullam. And we know that inside that cave he prayed. And we know what he prayed. Look at this next word because it's a big word. Soon. His brothers and all his other relatives joined him there. He wasn't alone much longer. Then others began coming. Men who were in trouble. Or in debt. Or who were just discontented. Until David was captain. Of about 400 men. What was happening here? At the cave. David was regrouping. Soon after David prayed. His family showed up. Then day by day others drifted in. Some were men who were in big trouble. Some had accumulated a lot of debt, probably owed Saul a lot of money and taxes. Others were just discontent with the status quo and craved change. All of them, like David, were on the run. In time, 400 men and their families rallied around David. And make note of this, they didn't come to hide. And they weren't conceding defeat. As far as David and his 400 men were concerned, it wasn't over, not by a long shot. As far as they were concerned, it's just beginning. There on the limestone cliffs overlooking the valley of Elah, David and his men organized themselves into one of the greatest fighting forces in all of history. Now, what's the lesson? 
in this story. What's going to be our takeaway for today? Here's something I want you to take home with you. Rock bottom can be a great place for a new beginning. You got it? Will you take that with you? Rock bottom can be a great place for a new beginning. Some of you can really identify with David's cave. Your journey has brought you to a similar place in life. At some point along the way, the climate of your life changed. And you've experienced more losses than gains. You started experiencing more failures than successes. You started experiencing more problems than solutions. Uh, You develop more enemies than allies, and you experience more defeats than victories. It was a real climate change. Your life went on the skids, and this current slide has brought you to a low point in your life. Your life is now characterized by loss. Perhaps you've lost your spouse. Maybe to divorce. Maybe to death. Maybe you've lost your family. Maybe you've lost your best friend. Maybe you lost your job, and it just looks like to you your career has gone up in smoke. It is possible that you've lost your sense of security, and your life is now shrouded in uncertainty. I don't know what you've lost. I don't know how much you've lost, but if I could just peek into your cave for a moment... I would quickly recognize that your losses have been great. You're hurting. You're scared. You're depressed. And to make matters worse, you feel so alone. It's as though the rest of the world is carrying on with a life oblivious to what you're going through. You often pause and ask, does does anybody see? Can anybody see? Does anybody see me? Is anybody aware of what I'm going through? If so, is there anybody out there that really cares about me? You'd like to give up, wouldn't you? I know. The cave has that impact on us and our attitude. The cave of Adullam would have been the perfect place for David to give up. It would have been the perfect place for David to have given up on God's plan for his life. You know, if I had been the one in the cave, uh, I'd have prayed. I would have. I I would have prayed, but my prayer would have sounded a lot different from David's. I probably wouldn't have got on my knees in a posture of humility. I would have probably looked straight up in the air, maybe with a clenched fist raised toward God and asked, What? Are you doing to me? What are you thinking? I didn't ask for this. I was minding my own business when you told me you had chosen me and called me to be Israel's next king. No, I didn't have much of a life, but I had a life. Nobody was trying to kill me, and now everybody's trying to kill me. I didn't have much, but I've got more than I've got right now. And then I would have said something like this. So here you go, God. I quit. You get somebody else to be your king. I bet some of your recent prayers sound a little bit similar to that. You'd like to hand God your resignation. If you're at a low point in your life, you need to know that God didn't let you hit rock bottom to end your life. Listen to me. If you're at rock, you've got to know this. God didn't allow you to hit rock bottom to end your life. God has allowed you to hit rock bottom so that he can reroute or redirect your life. Rock bottom is no place to quit. If you quit at rock bottom, you'll be bitter the rest of your life. Rock bottom is the perfect place to regroup. David didn't quit. He regrouped and he started over. Your journey doesn't have to dead end in a cave.
You don't have to abandon God's plan or the dreams that he placed in your heart because you've hit rock bottom. You can start all over because rock bottom is a great place for a new beginning. So in light of that, what am I encouraging you to do? You ready? Don't give up. Look up. Man, don't give up. Look up. Rather than quitting, what did David do? He looked up. David realized he wasn't alone. God was with him in that cave. Someone did care. God cared. There was a way out. God was the way out. So David prayed. He put himself and his future completely in God's hands. I got to thinking about this week. Who knows? Perhaps all the success David had experienced had gone to his head. Maybe he had started giving himself credit for all that he had accomplished. If so, it appears that hitting rock bottom had jolted David back to his senses in the cave David saw very clearly that God alone was responsible for his success. And he saw very clearly that God alone is my way out of this predicament. So David looked in the only direction he felt he could. He looked up. He had a heart to heart with God. And did you notice that's when things took a turn for the better. David prayed. And God began to orchestrate a new beginning. You know, hitting rock bottom isn't altogether a bad thing. It can be humbling. It can restore a healthy perspective. It can bring us back to a place of complete and utter dependence on God. Rock bottom can be a great place for a new beginning if, rather than giving up, you will look up. When you hit rock bottom, it's time to shift your focus. You can't keep looking back and inventorying what is lost. You can't keep looking back and taking note of what did or did not happen. You can't keep looking around and paying attention to who or what is now missing. You can't keep looking around and staring into the faces of people who don't really seem to care. You got to stop looking back and you got to stop looking around and you got to start looking up. You're not alone. Someone does care, someone can and will help, and that someone is listening. God is listening. So talk to him. Like David, you tell him all about your troubles. You tell him exactly how you feel. You be completely honest with him. He can take it. Ask for his guidance and ask for his help. Place your future squarely in his hands. Then you admit to him, you're my hope. You're my only hope. But in you, I've got a lot of hope. You place your future squarely in his hands and then you trust him. You wait patiently on him and see what happens. Don't be surprised when piece by piece, day by day, God begins to rebuild your life. After all, Rock bottom is a great place for a new beginning. Let's pray together. I don't know what's been going on in your world. I don't know what you've lost. I don't know how you feel. But I know very clearly that God gave me this sermon to share here with you. So I know that someone sitting here is at a low point. Maybe it's not rock bottom, but 
Maybe it's as low as you've been in a long, long, long time. And you're hurting. And you're fearful. And you feel so alone. And you've been surveying your situation and wondering, where do I go from here? What's my next move? Because I don't see a move. Well, you've got one. A big one. And a good one. An effective one. So I want you to know something. Wherever you are, you're in this dark place in your life, this low place. You're in your own personal cave like David. I want you to know something. You're not alone. God is with you. He cares for you. And he's capable. His plan, he hasn't discontinued his plan for you. He may be changing the route. You need to look to him. You need to place your life and your future in his hands and say, okay, okay. I'm yours. 100%. I'm yours. God, I'm yours. My future is yours. I'm not going to assume I know where to go from here, what to do anymore. I'm going to assume you know. And put my hand in your hand. God, I want you to lead me out of here. Day by day, step by step, lead me out of here. Lead me to what you know is next. Lead me to what you have determined is next for me. Help me, God, to trust you. With tomorrow. Father, we bow here. To, if every one of us at some point in our lives have hit rock bottom. And I thank you that every time that has happened, if we just look up, we recognize that you're there. And, and Lord, in hindsight, when we look back at these episodes in our lives, we realized that you brought good out of them. Our lives wouldn't be what they are. We wouldn't be headed in the direction that we are if we hadn't hit rock bottom a time or two and had to back up and let you recalibrate our lives and and put us in the direction you wanted us to be. I'm praying today for someone who's sitting here. And God, if they're not at rock bottom, they're near it. And I pray that there'll be an enlightening that takes place in their mind and they'll recognize there's a better way there's a better time and that they will look to you place themselves in your hands and let you take over and perform a marvelous rebuilding for them thank you God for your word and the encouragement we find in your word I pray that you'll bless each and every one who has come here today in the name of Christ we all pray together amen thank you guys you're dismissed